Hey, y'all. It's April, host of Bitches in Bourbon. So I haven't even started to um, edit this episode that is going to play next, but I think I remember how it went. So I thought I would just say you're welcome up front. Have a great time. So long to y'all. Bye. This is going to be your best Listen. podcast ever. <laughs> <laughs> Epicurean. But OFC and pink lemonade's pretty damn good. It'll put your boat in the marsh. <laughs> Jesus did not die so you could eat yellow number five. <laughs> Excitable. The nose starts off gentle with noticeable sense of grain that takes shape in the form of fresh baked bread. Ma'am, you're in the wrong podcast. <laughs> Educated. I have used the term overproof for so long um, without really knowing what it if it was. It, yeah, it, because for Is me, there a definition officially? Welcome to Bitches and Bourbon. Yes. Just testing the mics. Gotcha. What right. are you doing, baby? I was gonna come hang out with y'all for a minute. Are you really? Hell yeah. Sit Robbie next to you though. That's fine. You wanna sit on my lap? All right, so we're gonna get started here. You guys can see how the magic happens. It's a lot of fun. Um, just for my sanity, here's what I'm gonna tell you. Say whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. I'm a great editor. Like if you say some shit and you're like, fuck, I didn't really mean to say that, not a problem. I could take it out. Um I need to. Couple, couple of things, couple of things when I'm recording that's a pain in the ass to edit when there's sidebar conversations or we talk over each other. So just like as soon as the other person finishes, like then just kind of move in. And if you're not directly in front of a mic, if you could lean in when you do that, that'd be fantastic. I'm not talking. Um, because if not, if not, then it gets all kind of fucked up. All right. All right. Are Wait, we ready? Don't start. Don't start. Don't start. Sorry. Three, two, one. Beep. <laughs> I I could have done it. <laughs> yeah, I've got the timer right here. <laughs> Game started. And we're live. Hello, Reba. How are you? <laughs> hey, April. <laughs> well, that was fun. <laughs> I guess I guess instead of our normal pre-show banter, yeah. we'll just go ahead and tell you that we are joined today <laughs> by the infamous paintball coach, Air Force retiree, whiskey extraordinaire, Chuck Johnson. Welcome back, sir. Hey. Hey, thanks, ladies, for having me back. Uh, you have an open invitation. I think we've told you that numerous, numerous times. Uh, agreed. Especially because every time you show up to hang out with the bitches, you bring bottles. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost a, a requirement, right? A, a no, it's never. I, I wish that was a requirement. It is It is absolutely not. You're always welcome. But that It's you an appreciation. We, we appreciate <laughs> it very, very much. Well, I, I appreciate the spending time with other uh, alcoholics <laughs> i mean um drinkers 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 consumers consumers <laughs> imbibers what you would love to know about chuck and why i wish sometimes we did video but not nearly as often as i'm glad that we don't <laughs> is that chuck is currently sitting here in a whiskey and paintball t-shirt and an uncle nearest premium whiskey ball cap so I, I think he came dressed for the occasion i love that i definitely yes. have to represent so um when I retired, I decided, okay, I can't be coaching sober. <laughs> it, it, it seems wrong. You it's why play you, sober. It's why you let me hang out with you. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something in that Gatorade bottle. We have not been banned from the field. <laughs> well, that's because we know how to put it in a body armor. Yes. Uh -huh. So yeah. <laughs> it, it's always absolutely fantastic. And I love that you wore the hat tonight. It is an episode that is long overdue that is not tonight, unfortunately. But Chuck was one of the folks who hung out with Reba and I when we got to meet um, Victoria, Victoria Butler, Butler. Yes. from Uncle Nearest. And that was a man. That was a fantastic evening. That was an amazing evening. I should have paid for the VIP so I could go and sit and actually have a, a decent conversation with her. Spoke with her briefly, like 60, 90 seconds. And the woman is amazing. Yes. And to know the the heritage of 
uncle nearest and whiskey making in the U.S. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yes. What I think I loved most about that was, A, you absolutely should have. The VIP was worth every dollar to well, go it sold hang out. out. It, it was wonderful. It sold out so quickly. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was very popular. It, it was worth it. Yes. But what I really loved was during the Q&A, uh, and, and not because it was my question, but it was just, I, I thought it was the question that really needed to be asked was because Uncle Nearest and his association with Jack Daniels and the current type of kind of discord that happens in our country. And I asked her what it felt like not only to be a person of color, but also a woman running a a, a whiskey brand that kind of focused on this black American and white American in a period of time where that normally didn't happen. How did she feel about moving that forward in the American conversation, specifically as it discussed as it pertained to whiskey, I thought her answer was absolutely beautiful when she said that her table was big enough for everybody. Yes. And I thought that that not only embodied like who we are as people, uh, but particularly to the whiskey industry, I love how that kind of speaks to the fact that no matter what you prefer, if you drink, don't drink, like whiskey, don't like whiskey, like a particular type of whiskey, have preferences. It's all the same table. We can all have our own glass and we can all just go cheers and just kind of love on each other and enjoy, enjoy it, it yeah. while we share drinks together. And so I thought her answer was beautiful. She was beautiful. And that was just one of the best nights ever, I thought. Yeah, that was an amazing evening. Uh, lots of uh, good whiskey. And when you do the uh, Uncle Nearest episode, I'll, I'll take that guest appearance if you... Can I be really honest with you? you tolerate it? I, yeah, I would love that. And I'll be really honest with you. We haven't done it yet because I, I feel so ill-equipped to do it. Like, it's one of those episodes that I really want to give proper, like, respect towards. And so I always feel a little intimidated when I go to do it because I want to make sure I do it properly. And so I've always just kind of keep pushing it down the line. Like, one day I will be competent enough. One day I'll be good enough to kind of give that whiskey its due. I I'll get there. But you also have a means of reaching out to her. And so... Maybe we can schedule a time for a guest. That would uh, that would be an additional guest. It, yeah, and honestly, a, another conversation I would love to have while we're putting shit out in the universe is uh, like Faye Wilson is the CEO of Uncle Nearest, and I they just think that that movement that she's done and, and the way that they've created space for everybody within that company uh, is just a fantastic kind of opportunity. So. As a matter of fact, I wrote a paper and she was in it. So <laughs> that's how much I appreciate that brand. That's how much I appreciate what they're doing in the whiskey industry. Because for me, and it, and a lot of times we do, we get on here and we try a couple of things and sometimes we start talking in calligraphy and, <laughs> and that's fine. I never want to miss the fact that that whiskey is an art. We find it an art. We appreciate it as an art. And that's just kind of why we, we're here and why we like to do all the things. I think that that's a great segue into what we're doing this evening because we're talking about the inclusivity of whiskey and how, yes. which is kind of how we started as women who preferred whiskey. Yes. The inclusivity of whiskey and what it can do and what it brings and, and the different varieties therein. If you Options remember, are endless. <laughs> they really are. And if if you remember, the first time Chuck was here, he brought us Heaven's Door, uh, which is a collaboration uh, with Bob Dylan and his whiskey. And that's a beautiful, beautiful bottle. Tonight, Chuck took us from the West to the East, <laughs> right? He brought us two great representations of Japanese whiskey. It is a variety of whiskey that we have not done on the show before. So I'm super, super excited about that. The first thing that's in our glass uh, tonight is the Tenjaku. And it is a blended whiskey out of Japan. And so I have not had this one before. So I suppose what we should do. Maybe is take cheers. a drink of it. Yeah, maybe see what that tastes like. Oh, that's good. Anyone else finishing with like plum or I, I'm, some I'm, sort I'm of I'm closing fruit? my eyes. I'm closing my eyes. I'm making a prediction. Reba does not like it. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm still closing my eyes so that I get no facial cues from her. This is, I'm going to tell you why. Reba does not care for this bottle for the exact same reason. That you love it. That I love it. <laughs> because Wait, wait. Can I guess? 
Yes. Because it's very scotchy. It's very. Yes. But it's not super scotchy. If we put it up against the smokehead or some of the way peatier scotches that we've done, this is not that. Right. Of course, if you throw it up against like the Glamourage Tale of Winter, which is your current favorite, it also does not have the sweet notes that kind of even out that peat flavor, that easy, easy peat flavor for right. you. I think this is fantastic. I am absolutely in love with this bottle. It is it's velvety. It has a very, like Chuck said, it's got a very scotchy kind of feel to it, but in an easy, it's like a Sunday morning scotch, <laughs> right? Like it's. I do agree. Cool. Like it is definitely like whenever I think of my scotch tolerance, if you will, like it's definitely more on the mellow side, but it's definitely still kick enough that it is not something that I'm going to pour again in my glass. Oh, okay. So because we moved so quickly, because we got the paintball start, we were quick on the break. <laughs> I love it. Quick off the box. It's yeah, perfect. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So when as soon as the, as soon as the bell rang, we went. We were we had our guns up. We were throwing paint. Right. Swinging did, it. Yep. We did all the things. Pause and go back to intro. So let me go back to intro. <laughs> so we have we have so obviously we have Chuck. He's a return guest here. He knows just how to get in and get into the conversation. We also have two other folks hanging out with us tonight. Um, we have Shay. Do you want to say hello, Shay? Hi, hey, Shay. Uh, and then we have. Robbie. Robbie, would you like to say hello? Hi, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Dang, Robbie got that bass in his voice. <laughs> I'm you? all about that bass. <laughs> can you can you hear yourself, sir, in the headphones? Like you I, I told you. <laughs> like you've missed your yeah, calling as a voice A voice actor. and face for radio. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I didn't and I wasn't even gonna put that in there. When I took it out of the box, that was one of the first thing I noticed is the color. So the color is kind of light. It's it, it's a really mellow, almost what you would expect from a scotch. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was kind of looking forward to what that was going to look like because Japanese whiskey is also the only other whiskey outside of scotch that leaves out the E. So they are W-H-I-S-K-Y without the E. And the Japanese whiskey is the only other whiskey that I'm aware of at this present moment that doesn't, is is not the EY. I wonder why. Uh, because they're, because they're heritage. So, so Japanese whiskey is kind of like, uh, it, it was a take on the Scottish. So like where all the whiskey came from when they were figuring out how to make water safe to drink and they were doing all of these different fermentations and the Scottish folks came up with scotch. The Japanese whiskey is a direct line from scotch. Like that's, it goes scotch, Japanese whiskey. So I'm assuming that's why they would, they would carry on uh -huh. that spelling. So yeah, that's kind of where it Somebody comes from. did some research. I, you know me, you know me. <laughs> always prepared. I, always. I don't know about always prepared. I will tell you that I was super glad that the podcast that we recorded before this featured the Redwood Empire head distiller, Lauren Pats, yeah. who happens to be fluent in Japanese. And so I made sure that I kind of ran <laughs> these two pronunciations by her. It doesn't mean I'm not going to fuck a whole lot of them up. Especially by the time it rolls around later in the episode. I, yeah. <laughs> I may mess them up. That's speaking in cursive. It, I like calligraphy. We used to call it. Speaking in cursive. We yes. don't do that anymore. We call it calligraphy. It's kind now. of a next level on a. It's classy. Yeah. Because we're classy yes. bitches. We're classy bitches. <laughs> well, for the evening, I'll, I'll pretend to be classy as well then. And you have to pretend. You have to pretend. It's like everybody has like different things living in them and we do these different things depending on. And sometimes I'm classy. What? Never mind. I'm not going there. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Next, next, next. So, yeah. Um, so for me, the first bite that's scotchy. That's the the tattooed Adam Levine portion, and then that smooth kind of mellow fruity finish. That's the Commodores. At the, I think I I wish I had done that. Like you just said, the thing that I wish I had thought of. I think you're absolutely right. There's a thought bubble above your head. I saw it, so I just said it. Oh, shut up! You're so good. <laughs> just bringing it all together. I do have a question. So when you when you knew that this was you wanted to come back and say hello, tell me. What was the idea behind, hey, I think I'll bring Japanese whiskey this time? Well, so I'm sorry. I'm a bit uh, late. We're supposed to go to Japan to visit my son who's stationed there uh, in Okinawa. Thank you for your service as a 
serve as parent. You're it, welcome. It's tough. <laughs> it, it feels weird when people thank me, thank me for my kid's well, service. It, that, that, that's tough, right? That's tough when you send your baby out to go defend the free world. You've defended the free world. That's a, I had a veteran ask me, why do you thank me for my service? It's the same as me going to do the same, you know, a, a job, the same as everyone else is expected to do. And then and when I your said, time is up, no, no, sir, no. please exit. But, but <laughs> exit like stage I, left. But like I, like I said, like, it's the same, like with my profession, like people will say that to me as well, because there's not a lot of people willing to do it and we need people to do it. Yes. And so that's where the respect comes in of you don't have to, you could have picked any job. Yep. So we appreciate that you chose and are still doing. <laughs> but it wasn't but it wasn't until I was a service member myself that I realized that while I whenever somebody appreciates my service, I'm always very thankful t- for them for recognizing it. But it was also the point when I realized that my job was not the hardest job in what I did, right? Like for me, Military kid is the hardest job in the military, period, point blank. Like there's no other, there's no harder job in the military than being a military kid. Like those are the folks that are like really putting everything on the line. What I do, like when I went, like when you went, is significantly easier than what children have to do, followed by the spouses. I was going to say, I I think the spouse maybe has it um, a bit harder. Except for spouses are old enough to kind of have like mental resources and emotional tools to kind of deal that children just don't have. Right. But spouses are also old enough to have the angst that children don't really get yet Mm -hmm. about, uh, is my, my parent in danger? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then when you get older and you have those children and those children decide they're going to follow in your footsteps, (laughs) you have to send them off into the world and sending children off into the world is hard enough. Yeah. And then when you're sending them off to defend the country, like that's like, thank you. Thank you. Because, and I'm not going to get off on a big deal thing. And I am a little bit in my feels because um, a beautiful woman that I served with when we deployed to Iraq in 2001, she, Lieutenant Commander Teresa Rouse, is -hmm. retiring after 24 years of pride full naval service on Friday. Yes. Yes. Are you going? Yes. I'm absolutely going. And so, Lieutenant now, so she goes from lieutenant commander to lieutenant commander retired. She's a beautiful person. So I'm a little in my feels about service because I know what she's sacrificed and I know what she's given to like be able to go that long. Mm-hmm. Um, Accomplish this. So I'm, I might be in my, a little bit in my feels because we're so close to that particular time. And I remember we were both enlisted together. So she was an enlisted before she got her commission. Oh, wow. Yeah. So all of that holds a super big place in my heart. So thank you. Thank you for letting your baby, because there's so many parents that would would try to like talk their kids out of doing that kind of thing. So thank you so much for supporting your kid. Well, thank you for your support and thank you for your service. I, I do want to point one thing out from a civilian perspective. Uh, one of the things that I think is really special about military service is that in my 20s, I had the freedom to experiment and make mistakes and do what I wanted to do and move where I wanted to move. And military people have to deal with a very high degree of responsibility very, very early on in their lives. And they don't get the freedom to make mistakes. They don't get the freedom to experiment. They don't get the freedom to move where they want to go. And uh, that is kind of an unnoticed part of the sacrifice or part of the duty of being an uh, armed, forces, armed forces person. Uh, got started drinking a little earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> Your calligraphy <laughs> sounds beautiful, Robbie. Your I, think calligraphy I think it's a really special thing that really people don't really notice very much. And and, uh, you know, looking back at my civilian life and seeing how many how many freedoms I had to do those things and the way that uh, people sacrifice those abilities and those freedoms to do those things so that so that we can do those things is, is really special. So thank you very much to everybody who serves. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. That's awesome. I know I'm all in my fields. I was in my fields before. Now I'm all up in my fields. <laughs> All right, so you know what happens when you get all up in your feels. You have to drink to it. You have to drink to it. Solancha. Prost. Prost. No, so we were supposed to take family trip to Japan earlier this year, and we had to delay it. My uh, mother-in-law had oh, some yes. health issues. Uh, she's doing fine, um, but um, Shelly's 
up in New York again, you know, visiting her, making sure things are good. So I was supposed to bring back three or four different bottles strictly from Japan. And I'm like, well, I can't do that now. Let's <laughs> let's go to the liquor store and see what we can find. Let's find a reason to drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but fear not. Um, we are going to do the trip at the end of August. And I will definitely hit the duty free heavily and bring something back. And maybe we'll do Japanese whiskey part two. Maybe. Maybe. Well, if I don't drink it up before I get home. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I will tell you, my first foray into Japanese whiskey was com- by complete happenstance. So I've always been a, a huge sake fan. And I love my sake hot. I, I know that a lot of people like theirs cold. And as somebody who typically likes their whiskey cold, it's kind of odd for me to go, but I do. I prefer my sake hot. But that was my only kind of frame of reference for a, a Japanese alcoholic beverage. Um, but I took the kids to the aquarium and a whole little long weekend in Atlanta doing all of the things, right? An amazing, amazing place. Right. And there was a new sushi bar that had opened and the kids wanted to go there because it's the new cool thing for children 12 to 16 to want to buy sushi that I could, couldn't afford until I was in my thirties, but whatever, (laughs) (laughs) whatever. So I took them there and because they were just opening, their entire whiskey bar was Japanese whiskey. Like that's all they had. Like if you weren't drinking Japanese whiskey, you weren't drinking whiskey. You were drinking something else. Their other spirits were an amalgamation of of different types of whatever, but their whiskey was exclusively Japanese and they had a whiskey flight. So there was five of them. I think I liked three of them. I didn't particularly I wasn't really thrilled about the other two but I wasn't really in a in a Japanese whiskey frame of mind we weren't doing the podcast at that point so I wasn't evaluating whiskey on the experience and that kind of thing so I can't really remember what it was we d- I tasted I don't know I just knew that it was my first foray into Japanese whiskey and I wanted to try that out and I wanted to make sure that I got a whole range of things mm-hmm. because what I know is that you can you can taste a particular type of spirit. Gin is the one that comes to my mind most easily where I make that face most of the time until I drink Hendrix, until I drink a floral type gin that's heavier on the floral end and not so much the licorice end. Mm-hmm. So if I try a, a wide variety, then maybe I can kind of figure out where I'm going at in this. So th- I knew enough to know that the Japanese were doing something beautiful. So I'm really glad that you brought these two bottles so that we can kind of dig a little deeper. I did not realize that Japanese whiskey is kind of an offshoot. I don't want to say offshoot. It's so hard to kind of inspired just, by inspired. Thank yeah. you. Cause I was having, yeah. I was having a really tough time because you, you never, great wa- way to yeah, play. because like, here's what I know about Japanese whiskey when I'm doing my research. Here's what I know. I know that the Japanese distillers are an amazingly prideful group of men. And I say men only because I haven't found a woman out there yet. Mm -hmm. They're an amazingly prideful group of men that take seriously their art. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate whiskey makers that that when they look at their bottle, they don't look at a price point, they don't look at a profit, but they look at – the camaraderie that they can mm-hmm. produce when they put people around a table with a glass. And uh, to be honest, I think that's Japanese culture in general, right? Where they're really, really um, prideful about whatever they choose for their their vocation in their life or, or what they do as a hobby. So to see it reflected in how great this bottle tastes, I'm I'm happy with it. And can, can you and I just for two seconds, because I feel like I want to... I feel like I want to unpack something, and I do this all the time because I always worry about being misunderstood. If we can unpack really fast the connotations of the word prideful, for me, that's a compliment. Yes, same here. Yeah, same okay. here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't. S- if if I were going to use it as a derogatory, I would say egotistical. I, if I was going to use it as a derogatory, I would say narcissistic because everybody would automatically know exactly what I meant. Yeah. Ego, I'm fine with ego. Ego, I'm good <laughs> with. Vanity, vanity, I'm good with. 
pride, I'm amazingly good with. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I just wanted to make sure that that it was really clear that when we say prideful, it's a compliment. It's a compliment. It's it's a huge compliment. All right. So we had the tenyak. Ooh. Tenyaku. Yeah. So tenyaku. yeah, but I heard it pronounced two different ways. So I heard it pronounced tenyak with and then tenyaku. And I'm not really sure which one is the preferred way. Because honestly, when I heard it pronounced tenyak, it was from a native speaker. Mm -hmm. I, I think the native speakers will forgive the uh, the English people trying to say the Japanese word. Yeah, and, and they'll give you that little. <laughs> <laughs> You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Anybody who watches anime or any um, cultural stuff from Asia will know that. <laughs> yeah, because like I pronounced Shay's name wrong like three times, and then <laughs> and then she finally corrected me too. Didn't that occur? Did in that Shay. do it again. Did Shay? And she was like, "I don't normally correct people," and I'm like, "No, please do." <laughs> My name is April Kekwava Trapanye. Like, correct me. I want to be right. <laughs> but then you hit it out of the park. Yeah. By giving her a, a nickname, Shay, that we had literally just discussed driving here. Well, it, well, my husband calls me Ape because I hate it when he calls me April. It, when he when my husband calls me April, I'm like, the fuck did you just call me? Like, <laughs> am I in trouble? I, no, I'm never in trouble. <laughs> so you Fair should, enough. So you should never call me that. It's just weird to have my... Anyway. So, yeah, she was like, I never correct people. And I'm like, I really want you to be right. So I want to give this whiskey one last compliment. The fact that we've all got to the bottom of our glasses and no one's asked for ice or water. Mm -mm. No, doesn't need it. No, it absolutely doesn't. And I know that we have two bottles to do this evening. And if we can get to it, if time allows, there's a third bottle I'd like to talk about. If we don't, that's fine. Um, but no, this particular bottle. I, I... <laughs> if I add ice, the scotch flavor is not going away. <laughs> Sorry, Reba. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> I did warn. I did warn you when I said this is what we're going to do. It, yeah, it's except for inspired by now. Now I'm a bit curious. I wasn't curious about the ice before because I just like it. But the truth is, is that scotch is typically scotch and water. Like mm -hmm. scotch is typically taken with a little bit of water or a little bit of ice because that's what it takes to open up that stuff. But we've done that before. So I'm just going to assume that this is going to go down the same road that every other scotch <laughs> that we opened up with water ever did. And she's not going to do it. So we're back and we have moved from the Tenjake, Tenjaku. Tenjaku. I'm going Tenjaku. 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 Yes. Tenjaku. Ten, that's how you go said it sounds, to begin with. We're going to go It sounds like a Star Wars character, so I'm going Tenjaku. Ten, do you like that? Tenjaku. That, does that yes. work for you? Yes. All right. So, like, a, like a system, like the Tenjaku system. Oh. <laughs> so we're going to move from that. And, <laughs> and Chuck also bought the Hibiki uh, Japanese Harmony. Yes. yes. Suntory, Suntory whiskey. Well, Japanese Suntory harmony. is actually, and, and I don't want to get too far into it before we taste it, but Suntory is actually one of the one of the longest standing whiskey distillers in Japan. So Japanese whiskey started to be distilled sometime in the 1800s. It didn't become commercially available until the early 1900s. And um the Santori is one of the originals. Like it's one of the ones that have always been there. 1923. And, yeah. And oh, so wow. it is, it Established. is. So that's kind of how Japanese whiskey works. I can't wait to taste it. Um, after the Tenjaku, I can't, I, it, the bar was set pretty high. Like, I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Wait, who knows how to say cheers in Japanese? Not me. We should have asked. I should have Someone asked. please uh, put asked. that in the podcast. <laughs> yes, GGIB. Oh, that's good. Yeah, but bef I I'm going to tell you Reba likes that one even less. Yes, I was going to say that one's more scotchy. It is more scotchy. But honestly, the flavor profile oh. of it. It is complicated. When I'm just I comparing guess. those two. I would prefer to taste this again than the other one. Do you think maybe because it's got it, it's spice heavy? 
it's 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 spicier, so maybe it kind of camouflages the peaty flavor for you a little bit. Maybe I almost wanted to say that the other one seemed tighter. Almost, I don't. I, I guess maybe I'm maybe I, maybe I'm not using the right terminology because it's been a minute since I've had the other one. <laughs> See, for me, this one is far more tingly in my mouth. Yes, the tingly. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. I need a second. <laughs> Uh, no, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm having a hard Transition, time. Transition, that's what she said. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with the words. Maybe it is the spice that helps it to not seem. It's definitely still scotch profile, without a doubt. But when I'm comparing just the two. You want to taste that? Mm-hmm. When I'm comparing just the two. Just like in what I would prefer to taste again, if I only had the two to choose from, I would choose this one, the Hibiki. All right. So I have to say I'm guilty of having had this one before. Okay. Right. I uh, have it on the bar at the house. Charles Dube is uh, Hibiki equipped. And I, I knew that this was a good one. Uh, the Tenjaku was next to it. I said, I'm not, I'm not seeing that one. So I purchased those two. And then there was like a $29 bottle of Japanese whiskey. And I'm, well, we're not going to do that. <laughs> But you know we've had lots of twenty nine dollar bottles of whiskey that was that are that are Surprise, pretty great, just fantastic. So I would be I would be thrilled to find out which one that was and like yeah. maybe kind of put them up because he Centauri doesn't surprise me that it's a great product. Doesn't surprise me that I like it. It doesn't surprise me that it's delicious because it has the advantage of whiskey time, right? Like it has the advantage of being around for so that, long. I was going to say the history of it. That it just yeah. has, it has barrels to pull from. It has experience. It has age. And all of those things mean something when you talk about whiskey. And so I'm not surprised at all that I love it. I will tell you that it's the exact same color all of these Japanese whiskeys remind me of the scotch when you look at it yes, in the bottle. I would agree with that. And Reba, you had something. So just, I mean, as <laughs> as highlighted multiple times, like I enjoy reading the labels and things like that. And while Centauri was established in 1923, the it says the on the box, It says, Hibiki is the Paragon of Harmony, launched in 1989. So that's a good while after they've been going and doing their thing, testing things out. Um, It says, to commemorate Centauri's philosophy of living in harmony with people and nature. Like, that's the basis of the Hibiki. Um, And it says, the name Hibiki means resonance in Japanese. Suntory whiskey hibiki resonates with the subtleties of nature infused by the 24 seasons of Japan's traditional calendar and reflected in the 24 facets of its bottle's design. So I just think like that's really cool to think about when you're savoring and and what tastings. you'll hear what you'll hear a lot of folks that talk about Japanese whiskey on a on a on a deeper level is they'll tell you that what makes Japanese whiskey different is the water quality because they say that the water quality that is in Japan is such that it just produces a better tasting whiskey. Interestingly enough, after Japanese whiskey came into commercial success, their supply couldn't meet their demand. So they couldn't produce enough whiskey to fill the orders that they were getting. So what would happen was they would source uh, neutral spirits or base spirits from other places, bring them in so that they could fill the demand that they had. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that changes things a little bit, right? Flavor profile shifts differently. And it's not Japanese whiskey at that point. It's Japanese whiskey and something else. So a very interesting thing that happened is in 2021, because, you know, I always go back to the Code of Federal Regulations here. Like, I always want to know what are we talking about? What are the rules? What are we doing? In 2021, Japan finally said enough. In order for you to be considered Japanese whiskey, your whiskey has to come from here. Like, these are the rules. And they grandfathered in because, and I appreciate that they did that, they grandfathered in. So by 2024, anything labeled Japanese whiskey 
is going to be distilled, the water aged, all just like scotch is from Scotland, Irish whiskey is from Ireland. In the same way, Japanese whiskey, as of 2024, it has to be distilled and made in Japan. Interestingly enough, if you go to the Code of Federal Regulations for the American side of the thing, Japan isn't even mentioned. There is no mention of Japanese whiskey in our code of of regulations. And the only reason I mention it is because marketing is a thing and bottle labels are a thing. So when you go into a store, I think you do better when you're educated on what the things on the bottle means. Because we've seen small batch, and that can mean damn near anything. Mm -hmm. And you've seen produced by, which doesn't mean distilled by. And all of these things that like they we use wordplay to kind of make the consumer think that they're getting whatever whatever but as of 2024 and I don't know that the I don't know what the fo- what the American code of federal regulations will do to kind of move into that but as of right now it's not mentioned at all in our code but 2024 in Japan that's what it's going to take to be able to label your whiskey Japanese whiskey we might need to pause for a second. So I'm searching the bottle for. No, go ahead. Or the box for where the distillery is. I don't know that it says it's that. not on. It's so, not on there. Uh, so yeah. all of the foreign. So that's looked, one of the. That's one of the biggest complications with imported whiskey is on the label. It's never where the distillery is. What's on the label when you buy it here in the States is always going to be where it's imported from. Mm-hmm. Product of Japan imported by yes. Bean Centauri. Always. Import. So Japanese company, whiskey, Chicago, Illinois. Scottish, um, scotch is like that. Tequila is that way. Like uh-huh. whenever you pull them, it's always going to be imported <clears throat> by. And, and that's where, because Western frame of thought is that that's just, that's all we care about. Like right. where did it enter our borders? And so that's all there is to be about that. I'm going to tell you, I, I like this one and I understand what Centauri does. And I think it's a great thing, but I'm really going to tell you, I really think that I like the, what is the Tenjaku? The Tenjaku f- I, finishes I, better. I, yeah, I do. I, I, I think it starts better. Uh, it starts okay. This one starts like a scotch. Again, so if you're drinking Japanese whiskey and understand that the flavor profiles are inspired by scotch and the, the rain in the background, then um, <laughs> you'll you go, okay, it makes sense that it starts like a scotch, but the Tenjaku finished really smooth, sort of like a bourbon for me. For me anyway. I, no, I agree. I completely agree. And so now you still have plans to go. Yes. So here's what I want to do, because I do have another bottle on my bar that's very readily accessible that I've enjoyed numerous times, and that's the Legion. And I don't want to get into the Legion today, but when you bring your bottles back and when you've been to Japan and you come back to the States, I really kind of want to talk about that infusion of, because Legion is a beautiful bottle. I'm not going to open it right now. But Legion, to me, is a very interesting bottle as a whiskey lover because it has an American distiller and a Japanese blender. And I think that is just such a fantastic idea of everything that whiskey can be. You find the synergy of the two cultures and go, make magic? Yeah. All right. It, it, it remind, What it reminds me of is of a beautiful table where everybody sits down and we're all talking and we're all eating and we're all doing our thing and everything is just community. And suddenly we need another bottle. And suddenly (laughs) we need another bottle, which I think we should go open. So I just want to throw something out here. Uh, Chuck, I know you're headed to Japan and I know headed to Japan and uh, I had a friend uh, a few years ago, and she spent some time in Japan, and she, her job was to liaise with local Japanese business people, and and they they took her out in the town, and they introduced her to Japanese whiskey, and and she she found a, a varietal, I guess you want to call it, of Japanese whiskey called Hakasui. So when you're out there, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Hakasui, whenever she finds it in the U.S., she always stockpiles it. So if you get a chance, and if you're listening to this podcast, 
and you're interested in Japanese whiskey, find Hakasui at your local local, local local liquor store and ask for it because she stocks bottles it every time she gets it. It's been a long time, so I can't compare it to what we just drank, but that is something to look for for next time. Okay, so I'm going to digress for two seconds because Ravi, <laughs> in all the things I love about him, Ravi in one brief interlude used the word liaise <laughs> and veritable in <Ooh>. this <laughs> I mean can we just acknowledge the fact that Ravi just said liaise and veritable in the same kind of go Ravi <laughs> so wise cheers <laughs> veritable lexicon <laughs> a veritable a veritable lexicon How's it go? Was it prost? Kanpai. 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 Kanpai is Japanese for cheers. Are you sure? Thanks you for Google, Google searching it. it. GGIB. GGIB. Go Google G-G-I-B. it, bitch. G-G-I-B. All right. I'm going to have to talk to Lauren. Thanks for hanging out with Ape and Reba on this episode of Bitches and Bourbon. Make sure to check out the links in the show notes, and we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, here's to bad bitches and good bourbon. Cheers. I mean, you have to like spicy pickle.